صباح الخير جميعا جود مورنينج ليديز اند جنتلمان اي ام اونرد تو سي سو ماني بيبل هير سينس اي ثوت وي جوينج تو بي ا جروب اوف اباوت 15 اور سو بت ليت مي سي ا فيري سبيشال ويلكم تو اور فريندز فروم اوفرسيز ويلكم تو ايجيبت ذا هارت اوف ذا ارب سبرينج ويلكم تو اول ذا اذر كوليجز اند فريندز who have joined this meeting. To our American friends, I should say, Happy Independence Day. But actually, it isn't. Actually, if you read the diaries of John Adams, you would see that he wrote on the 2nd of July that this day shall live forever and people shall celebrate the 2nd of July down the ages. But actually, it's the 4th of July, so what happened? Actually, what happened was that the vote in Congress for independence from the crown was taken on the 2nd of July. And Adams was therefore right because that was the crossing of the Rubicon having declared and voted this way, they were now, in the eyes of the British Crown, traitors to be hung if caught. And as in a famous witticism, therefore they had to hang together in order not to be hung separately. But uh, it was true. So what happened between the second and the fourth? It was actually the elaboration of the document of the declaration and the actual signing which took place on the fourth. But to me and to many others, it is very appropriate that the United States should be celebrating and the rest of the world celebrating with it on the 4th and not on the 2nd. Because contrary to the expectations of that early Congress, it was not their bill of indictment against George III that anybody remembers, that anybody cares for. It was actually the undiscussed and relatively swiftly passed 55 words that opened the Declaration of Independence that Jefferson penned, which were to remain to this day an essential part of the human legacy and an essential document that we all turn to. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Very short 55 words that transformed what was to become the American War of Independence from merely a dispute between subjects and their ruler about taxes and certain rights into a clarion call for liberty, for equality, for revolution, and for establishing a government whose just powers are derived from the consent of the governed. Just how revolutionary these concepts were back in 1776 is, of course, difficult for us to imagine. The people who did this had no guides, and later on, when they would come to the Constitutional Convention, they would have even fewer guides as to how to design such a government. But it was that call that was adopted on the 4th of July and not on the 2nd of July, that made American independence a revolution with a global human dimension for all societies and all times. Since our guests are from Roger Williams University, it's important also to refer to Roger Williams, who after all was not only the founder of the 
of Providence and of the state of Rhode Island, but was also one of the very early advocates of tolerance, religious freedom, and the separation of church and state, which would become actually one of the great legacies of the First Amendment. And Roger Williams University has, according to its website, dedicated itself to the principles advocated by their namesake, education, freedom, and tolerance. And it's important that uh, you honor the legacy of Roger Williams by modeling a community in which diverse people and diverse ideas are valued and intellectual achievement is celebrated, but also civic responsibility is expected. And I'll come back to that throughout my talk today, because this is a very special moment in Egyptian history. It is a moment where we are moving from what we could call our first republic to our second republic, much as France has, is now in its fifth republic. There are moments of transition in every society's time, and therefore it is a very special moment as Egypt thinks about what si kind of a society it wants to create and what sort of a constitution it should have that it should reflect on the experience of others, but remain open to the unique historic moment that we are living and imagine with the same boldness and imagination, the same pragmatism and skepticism that the founding fathers of the American Constitution had when they were drafting back in 1787. We should not copy the constitutions of others. They are, after all, documents that were produced by particular societal forces, particular political ideas, and particular circumstances in particular countries. They vary in their greatness and their effectiveness. They all have lessons to teach us. But surely our moment here is different. Our society is different. And perhaps it is the only opportunity we have to design a constitution that should be fit to match the requirements of the 21st century. Constitution for the age of the internet, a constitution which is the result of a Facebook revolution, a generation that lives in a globalized world that has acquired the sensitivity to the equality of human uh, rights as well as a sense of responsibility for the interaction between humanity and ecology. All dimensions that make us think differently than previous experiments. But it is important to reflect on past experience and none more appropriately than the United States. It's not just that the subsequent history of the Declaration of Independence is well known to you, the War of Independence through, from Bunker Hill, through Valley Forge, Saratoga, Yorktown, etc. But after independence, the states had a very unhappy experience, which were the Articles of Confederation. In fact, as you probably all know, George Washington was not the first president of the United States. In fact, depending on how you count, he was either the sixth or the tenth, because during the period of the Articles of Confederation, the presiding officer at the Congress was the president of the United States in Congress assembled, or so it was called. However, it was a very inappropriate arrangement. And those who met in 1787 in Philadelphia were determined to fix the situation. And there, the little giant who towered over all others was Madison, even though people like Hamilton and Jay had a lot to say. But he was there, and it was, in many ways, his plan, his ideas that dominated the Constitutional Convention. And that is particularly interesting for me because uh, the great sage of Monticello, Jefferson, close friend and mentor to Madison, 
uh, was at the time ambassador to France. It was two years before the French Revolution. He was ambassador to France. And in those days, there were no tweets. There were no SMSs. There were no emails. So people wrote long, thoughtful letters. And luckily, they are preserved. And we can see the quality, the quality of the debates and the thinking of these great statesmen. Flawed for sure, both were slave owners. But nevertheless, they were of a caliber of public officer rarely found today. And if you read the Jefferson Madison correspondence, you are struck by the level to which expediency is put aside in order to go back to principle. Among the most important things that you see in the quality of the debates that they had were questions about the meaning of democracy. For it was questioned whether a republican system could ever exist, had ever existed, or even would be conceivable in a country as vast as the United States. Didn't democracy actually require small groups who could participate and vote? And would indirect democracy be meaningful? In fact, we get one of the great contributions of political science from Madison, who says that the real meaning of democracy is not that the opinion of the majority should prevail, because after all, majorities being majorities could impose their view on the minority. It is, in fact, to protect the minority from the tyranny of the majority. And he says specifically, turning the argument on its head, that it is the vastness of the United States that will make this possible. For tyranny is likely to be exercised at the local level, but nobody will be able to have enough of a dominance at the national level in order to enforce a similar narrow tyranny. And that, therefore, the federal government, the new to be created federal government, would become the custodian and guarantors of freedom at the local level. Now, all of us who remember the civil rights cases, the marches in the south of the United States in the late 50s and early 60s with Martin Luther King will remember how the southern whites maintained severe segregation against the blacks despite the 13th Amendment and despite the Civil War. And that ultimately, it was federal authority that broke the back of segregation in the South. Madison was prescient long before the Civil War, long before the 1960s. He foresaw that it was the federal government that would help protect the minority from the tyranny of the majority. They argued about the Bill of Rights, Jefferson ultimately winning, saying that there has to be a Bill of Rights explicitly written and not implicitly assumed. And uh, Madison, however, promised everybody that as soon as the Constitution was passed in the first Congress thereafter assembled, he would bring the amendments to introduce the Bill of Rights, which he did. The ten first amendments became the Bill of Rights. Another prescient observation from Jefferson to Madison was the absence of term limits. And he said, if you do not put term limits, especially for the highest magistrate, the president, he shall be re-elected and shall become a president for life. So we in Egypt know something of that. And we can say that Right on, Tom. <laughs> you could see very clearly long before anybody else did. So why didn't it happen in the United States? Why well, it didn't happen because of the brilliance of Washington and his enormous self-restraint. He who could have been dictator, he could have been king, he could have been Caesar, 
chose to be Cincinnatus, chose to go home, chose to say two terms are enough for anyone. And the power of his example was so immense that that action lasted 150 years until Franklin Roosevelt decided in the 1930s to run for a third term. And he was challenged, how could you? And he says, show me what it says in the Constitution that it cannot be done. And sure enough, Roosevelt won a third term and won a fourth term, died a month and a half into his fourth term, but nevertheless, he was elected four times and counting <laughs> if he had lived. Thereafter, the U.S. passed the 22nd Amendment, limiting terms of office to two. Issues including the government debt. And just imagine today that we are discussing the government debt, the quality of the arguments between Jefferson and Madison. As Jefferson says, if we are into a land where there is no taxation without representation, we must put a limit on the length of time in which a government can encumber future citizens to repay its debts. After all, there will be future citizens who will be taxed without having been represented at the time of the decision. And he suggested five years as the length, the forward length to which the government could encumber future voters, uh, but to which, with his usual brilliance, Madison responded very profoundly and said there are many things whose benefits will accrue to future citizens and will take time but have to be paid for now. And he gave two examples, the first of which was education. If we borrow to build schools in which the future taxpayers are educated, is it not fair that they should pay for what they obtained as education? But even more compelling, he said, and shouldn't future taxpayers who have the rights of citizenship in this great new republic pay for the cost of the war of independence that made such citizenship possible? Now, I ask you, compare the level and quality of this discussion from the one that's going on today about the debt in the United States. <laughs> the idea of going back to first principles, to thinking through the fundamental justice or injustice of the actions being taken, the philosophical foundations on which they can be drawn, that is what marks the greatness of these individuals. But they also talked about everything from copyright to intellectual property rights. The United States Constitution having in Article 1, Clause 8, Section 8, a particular reference to providing uh, author's rights to creative people. But even then they talked about limiting the monopoly powers attached. They were, however, not above compromises. They were very pragmatic and practical people. And even Benjamin Franklin, founder of the first abolition society on American soil, was the first to rightly say if we push the issue of slavery now, we will never get agreement. The states shall split, and Britain shall defeat one part and then the other and bring us all back into slavery. And he was right, of course, since shortly thereafter, as you all know. In fact, during Madison's tenure as president, uh, as the fourth president of the United States, uh, Great Britain in the War of 1812 came in 1814 and burned down Washington, including the White House and the Library of Congress. So the threat that they were afraid of was not some chimera. It was a very real threat that they were facing at the time. And so they could set aside that issue. So they will set aside that issue because there is no way of resolving it right now. The main issue is to create a viable, independent United States for now. They also invented the bicameral legislative. 
how could small states like Rhode Island get in agreement with huge states like Massachusetts, Virginia, and New York? Equality in the Senate, proportional representation in the South. Ah, but what proportional representation? The Southerners demanded that their economy, which was largely driven by slavery, be recognized. And so the great and shameful compromise of counting slaves as three-fifths of a person was introduced. So it is partly that high attachment to principle and partly that enormous pragmatism to resolve questions and get things done that we need to learn from the American experience. For we cannot all depend on having a Washington with his restraint and his ability to allow the separation of powers to actually exist and not have an overwhelming executive power dominate the legislative and the judiciary. And if you want to summarize the U.S. experience on this occasion, I would say there are five documents that we should go back to. And if you go to the rotunda in the National Archives, you'll see all five of them are there. First of these is the Declaration of Independence, not for the details of the accusations against George III, because today nobody cares for that, but for that preamble that makes it truly a universal document. The Constitution, which remains the longest functioning constitutional document on earth. And the Bill of Rights, first ten amendments, without which the Constitution really is incomplete. And then a very important judicial ruling, for those who don't know it, Marbury versus Madison, by, written by John Marshall on behalf of the U.S. Supreme Court, establishes the judiciary as an equal branch of government and gives the Supreme Court the right to define what the law is and what the law is not. And in that long argument, there's a limitation on executive privilege, there's a discussion of the responsibility of officers like ministers, in this case the Secretary of State, when can the Secretary of State be considered to be acting as the advisor to the President and covered by executive privilege? And when is the Secretary of State a public servant? And as a servant of the public, can be brought forth before the public to account for his or her actions? All of that is in Marbury versus Madison, the most quoted of all the Supreme Court decisions. And finally, the Emancipation Proclamation. As you know, the war of independence, uh, the civil war in the United States was about slavery, but it was not about slavery at the same time. It was a war about maintaining the Union, and rightly, as, as uh, Lincoln said to Senator Sumner and uh, other abolitionists, this war is being fought by northern racists against southern racists. There were four slave states fighting on the northern side. So it was not all emancipation on the north and slavery in the south. And in fact, the first inaugural of Lincoln is very much about telling them, you can keep slavery, but let's not go to war, for the burdens of war would be great. And the Emancipation Proclamation, which came in 1863, is a very peculiar document. Here is Lincoln, the leader of the North, making a declaration of the emancipation of the slaves that doesn't emancipate a single person. For it is carefully written. It says, in the rebel territories. In the rebel territories, where his writ does not run, where as President of the Union he has no authority to liberate the slaves. 
But he doesn't liberate the slaves who are under his authority in the north. Now Lincoln gauged things better than anyone. And in fact, even that gesture resulted in rebellion in the Ohio regiments. Because a lot of people said, no, I'm not going to die for some black man. I'm dying for the Union, not for black. Uh, let them stay slaves or not. There was this kind of feeling. And he was not about to allow the four slave states on the north to bolt to the south and extend the agony of the Civil War. But he generated moral pressure on them. And as a result of that, within a year, by 1864, all four states had abolished slavery in the North. More importantly, as I look back to that document in particular, I see in it a truly revolutionary character which had escaped me in earlier readings when I was a younger and less tolerant individual. I was always looking for you know, high principle and I considered that all these compromises to get things done, whether by the founding fathers or by Lincoln, were somehow inappropriate. Now, on the contrary, I see that it is not just brilliance, but it is wisdom. And that's the difference between data which you organize becomes information. When you explain information, you have knowledge. Knowledge is not the same as wisdom. Wisdom is another quality, and that in my later years, I think I've acquired enough to appreciate the wisdom of a Lincoln. That document was truly revolutionary. Why? Because it said, by liberating the slaves in the South, the entire way of life of the South would be forever over. No matter what would happen at the end of the Civil War, there would be no return to an economy based on plantations and slavery there would be no return to a notion of three-fifths of a person. There would be no return to the notion of people as property and chattel. It was that radical statement that also enabled the equally radical amnesty that Lincoln declared at the end of the Civil War. We could turn the page, and as a result, of that turning of the page, we can start worrying about the orphan and the widow, as he said, and bind the nation's wombs with malice towards none and charity for all, this famous second inaugural. But in fact, in fact, it was possible only because there was a total emancipation. And Lincoln deservedly gets the title of the great emancipator, because if you look at the number of slaves in the United States, you will see that they had reached 4 million, and then in 1865, zero. So Lincoln stands forth, and yes, the Emancipation Proclamation takes its place as the fifth of the great founding documents of the United States experience. But for Egypt today, interesting as that experience is, and important and appropriate as it is for our American friends to be reflecting on this, during the 4th of July, we must think of ourselves much like Madison and colleagues in 1787. We can learn from past experience, but we have to imagine our own moment. We have a time when the world has changed more in the last 30 years than anybody could imagine. A world of the internet, a world of Facebook, a world of globalization, a world of uh, global trade and communication, a world of the credit crunch and uh, the, the financial collapse that we saw in 2007, 2009, a world of a complicated, overlaid structure of international relations, of multilateralism, of intergovernmental organizations, a world that shares visions of common values, such as human rights, dedication to environment and other transformations. So, in a world like that, should we simply be worrying about whether we should adopt a parliamentary system 
like that of the UK or a presidential system like the US or a modified presidential system like the French Fifth Republic or a federal system like Germany and the US and India or a non-federal system. Surely that is inadequate. Surely that is not enough. We must, with the same boldness, say we live in a different world and it's our opportunity to do something that nobody else has done. To rethink the foundations of what the fundamental premises that the founding fathers said when they did in the opening preamble of the Constitution, we, the people of the United States, mind you, they didn't say the states, they said the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution. So if we retain many of these same general terms of liberty and peace and prosperity, what sort of a constitution should Egypt at this moment in the 21st century be thinking of? Well, I have a proposal in ten chapters or ten articles to use the same definition as this, as this articles, but the first of which really should be, chapter one would be the definition of the nature of the state. And we have a very violent debate in Egypt right now centering on the existing clause two or article two of the existing constitution of Egypt that defines that the official language of Egypt is Arabic and the official religion of Egypt is Islam. And it then goes on to add that Sharia or the principles of Sharia will be a fundamental source of inspiration for legislation. We need to define the new state. What sort of a state we want? I would say we would want a republic. We want a republican, liberal, constitutional state. And yes, we can define a legal language. And I wouldn't mind saying the majority of whose citizens believe in Islam. But the notion that it is totally incompatible with the practice of democracy, as some people would say, I mean, just on the basis of scientific evidence is contravened by the fact that, for example, the Scandinavian countries specifically define Lutheran evangelical as the official state religion. That, of course, uh, Britain has the Church of England, which we all know Henry VIII established himself as the head of the Church of England because he wanted to divorce his wife and marry Anne Boleyn, but that was another story, another time. Uh, but as a Church of England, official church, Greece as an Eastern Orthodox religion defined in the Latin, Latin words, Costa Rica, Argentina, define themselves as Roman Catholic. So many of these states, especially the Scandinavian countries, nobody can say they're not really democratic, and yet they have an officially stated state religion. And there's a difference between a state church and a state religion, because, for example, Costa Rica and Argentina, having selected Roman Catholicism, therefore give a special position to the Vatican in managing their religious affairs, whereas the Church of England is a state church. So there are examples like that. But the question for us, again, is that this is a special moment in Egypt, and there is a danger that some of that may be taken over by more extreme elements and bring the kind of intolerance that we do not want. But then a proper Bill of Rights that is embedded in the original document of the Constitution that guarantees the civil liberties could retake some of the language of the First Amendment which says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And I'm very fond, I go around carrying a dollar bill in my uh, 
wallet because uh, in many discussions here in Egypt I say that does not mean that they are atheists. In fact, they are the only country in the world that puts on its currency in God we trust. See? In God we trust. And uh, it's true. No other country puts that. So <laughs> what more do you want? In God we trust. So you can be a theist. You can believe in God. And if you are a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew or whatever other, you choose the God you choose for yourself. But that is a question that has to be resolved. And it has to be resolved in a way that matches the American experience of looking to high principle, but also recognizing temporal pragmatism. But then we need something else, which is unique and would be unique to this new constitution. In defining the nature of the state, every constitution that I've looked at in the world is founded on the notion of state sovereignty, the sovereignty of the state. But the state today has become too big and too little. It is too big to deal directly with its citizens, except as a bureaucratic remote body. And it's too little to deal with the great issues of our time. Increasingly, we find that practically all big issues require the collaboration between states. And that the autonomous decisions made by one state, even one as powerful as the United States, cannot be imposed unilaterally on a vast and differentiated world. We're also a world where every country needs others. In Egypt, we are reminded of that every day by the waters of the Nile. We need our riparian neighbors and we need to be in agreement with them on how to manage this most vital of all resources. We all also recognize that increasingly the concept of nations in the world has created global values that we all adhere to, created international obligations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the concept of nations, the various conventions and treaty obligations that have uh, followed, and also our global responsibilities to generations yet unborn in how we interact with our ecosystems on this planet. So the whole notion of sovereignty has now also to include notions of how we interact with international law, not just through trade treaties, but also through our responsibility to others. As you know, the International Criminal Court is increasingly finding itself in positions where it can issue warrants, but do states have an obligation to honor them? Well, it all depends whether they agree or do not agree. But should we not, from the beginning, in this beginning of the 21st century, say that the state we want to create is one that is committed to work with the concert of nations, that is committed to uphold international law as it gets forged article by article over the coming decades. Having talked about sovereignty and having talked about the definition of the state, we have to recognize that all states ultimately have a cultural identity. In the United States, it was based on the notion of the melting pot, although nowadays the Hispanics are creating a big challenge to the notion of a single American culture by creating at least a bilingual one. Others have created different kinds of identities. Switzerland, for example, has very successfully created very diverse local identities, but that maintain an overall Swiss identity so that the Swiss Germans don't want to leave Switzerland to join Germany and the Swiss French speaking don't want to leave Switzerland to join France. They are all Swiss, but they recognize that enormous diversity Europe is trying to recreate that on a European scale, but they're not succeeding very well. And uh, there are other problems of that. But nature of cultural identity has got to be defined. And here we take the definition of culture as it was agreed in Mexico City in 
with God almost 30 years ago in, in uh, 1982, that culture is the whole complex of distinctive spiritual, material, intellectual, and emotional features that characterize a society or social group. And it includes not only arts and letters, but also modes of life, the fundamental rights of the human being, value systems, traditions, and beliefs. And that brings us, therefore, to what we should do in recognizing this diversity and that the richness that comes from diversity, and there should be in our Constitution, as there is in Article 1, Clause 8, Section 8 in the United States, where you talk about copyrights or author's rights, we need to recognize cultural diversity and cultural industries and creative enterprises and the rights of free expression and also a responsibility for cultural heritage. Memory and renewal are part of that. Conservation and reuse are part of that. And the supporting institutions of culture have a responsibility and a claim. In the United States, that is almost exclusively left to the private sector. But in almost all other countries, it is a collective responsibility. The last days of the Clinton administration, the United States was running a surplus. Employment was booming. Stock market was high. Everything was doing very well. People were wondering what to do about the surplus whether to prepay the, the national debt or not. At that time, the Republicans were attacking the $100 million, which is in the U.S. federal budget is, is not even a rounding error, that was granted to the National Endowment for the Arts, saying it is not the function of government to support the arts. And... Uh, uh, Jane Alexander, Clint Eastwood, and others came to defend uh, that. And I remember a senator saying, you and your friends could pay that hundred million if you wish. And he said, it's not the point. The point is that the government of the United States should make a symbolic gesture that it cares about the arts. <laughs> and the hundred million dollars of the National Endowment survived. But just think, at the same time, at the same time, in France, they had 10% unemployment. They were running over a 3.5% deficit, which was above the euro agreement of no more than 3%. And yet, neither the opposition nor the government would dream of cutting support to the Louvre, to the Musée d'Orsay, to the preservation of heritage, to the national museums, I mean, it would have been unthinkable. That is part of defining the cultural identity of a nation. And surely no nation in the world has proportionately more to preserve, more to conserve, more to keep proud of in terms of its roots than Egypt. And yet, we need to define what our primary collective responsibility should be. Chapter 2 really would deal with transactions and this organization of society, transactions being economic, cultural, and social. In our past constitution, we had a definition that was very socialist, which has been slightly amended, but still inadequate to deal with what sort of an economy do we have. I think we need a proper understanding of capitalism, that is free enterprise, private property, and competitive markets. Even as Vice President of the World Bank, I used to say we need to abolish the word free markets. What we want are competitive markets, and competitive markets require regulation. For within every capitalist lives a monopolist waiting to come out. And that's all right. That's the way it is. <laughs> that's very normal. There's nothing wrong with that. And we need to transcend, therefore, the notion of market versus state because we need a strong state that is capable of controlling antitrust regulation, controlling insider trading, controlling the rights of contracts to make sure that this actually operates as a competitive market. And actually, since we are with the university and at the Library of Alexandria, let me take two minutes to talk about how misunderstood the profound thinking of the founder of modern capitalism, Adam Smith, is. Practically everybody knows one 
line, sometimes even one word of Adam Smith, which is the invisible hand. Well, let me tell you exactly what it is. First of all, he wrote more than a million words. The Wealth of Nations, written in the year of the American independence, 1776, is a superb document worthy of being read, along with his other major work that deals with ethics and morals. But fundamentally, even in the Wealth of Nations, he says the following. The famous quotation is, as every individual therefore endeavors as much as he can to employ his capital, he generally indeed neither intends to promote the public interest nor knows how much he is promoting it. He intends only his own gain, and he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention. Now that, of course, assumes competitive markets that in the end, competitive markets will provide the best price, the best product, provided they are competitive. But he also recognized what we in economics today call public goods. And he also said in the same Wealth of Nations, the state is responsible for erecting and maintaining those public institutions and those public works, which though they may be in the highest degree advantageous to a great society, are, however, of such a nature that the profit could never repay the expense to any individual or small number of individuals, and which it therefore cannot be expected that any individual or small number of individuals would erect or maintain. So there are things the state should do, and actually he gave as an example of that education. While a capitalist may train workers to work in his factory, he would not be expected to ensure the literacy of the public at large, although that would be obviously a very beneficial thing for society. But the most patient of all, and remember he was writing over 230 years ago, given the mess that we saw in 2007 and 2008, is that this man also advocated banking regulation and supervision. And he says, you know, I know that people will tell me, how can I say the state should interfere in a transaction between the banker and the client? Wouldn't that really be an infringement of liberty? I, who always defend private property and liberty. And I say, says Smith, that given what we saw, and he's talking about the previous century, the Great Fire of London, we now tell anyone who wants to build on his property that they have to build a party wall that separates his property from the next so that fire will not travel the way it did before. And you could argue that this demand and requirement that we force a person who builds on his property to put a wall is an infringement of liberty. But, and that is the operative part, the the limitations on the few for the interests of the many are a duty of all governments. So he says, uh, uh, such regulations may no doubt be considered in some respects a violation of natural liberty. But those which uh, the, constrain the natural liberty of a few individuals which might endanger the security of a whole society are and ought to be restrained by the laws of all governments of the most free as well as the most despotic. And considering where we are today and watching what's happening today and the trillions that the taxpayers had to pay, I say Smith was prescient in all he did. So we must start out from a notion of defining what sort of an economy we want, but also the structure and purpose of regulation and supervision, and the provision of autonomous institutions like a central bank to supervise the banks, monetary authorities, and the like. But that's just for the economic side. On the social side, we need, I believe, in a new constitution in Egypt, to talk about the family and the rights of women and the rights of children. There is a convention that ends discrimination against women, the SEDAW Convention, of which we are a party, 
There is the Convention on the Rights of the Child, to which we are a party. And both of these need to be highlighted at a time when we are redefining the future of what is largely a patriarchal society. A largely patriarchal society, culturally. And we also need to define the idea of social solidarity as an integral part of the kind of society that we want, because that enables us, therefore, to draw from that the kinds of institutions that one will want to create by laws under such a constitution. But that constitution today should also address questions that have troubled philosophers for a long time and troubled recent people in thinking about them more so than at any other time. And these are the meaning of justice and the meaning of liberty. The meaning of justice, to take a great definition well known to many from John Rawls, the justice as fairness. And all of you may think that everybody can agree on the word fair. I mean, surely everybody wants something to be fair. Not just legal, but fair. But actually, fair can lead you to exactly opposite decisions. Is fairness equality of opportunity and then let the chips fall where they may? Or is fairness looking at outcomes and saying if systematically certain groups in society are impoverished, marginalized, and excluded, something must be done about those groups regardless of whether or not they had an equal opportunity at the beginning? Now, these are two very, very different ways of looking at what is fair. And it's not just the, the notion of opportunity, there's also an inherent notion of a certain equality. Yes, equality before the law is fundamental, but how equal are we when someone like O.J. Simpson and, and uh, Dominique Strauss-Kahn can afford legal teams at uh, 60, 70 thousand dollars an hour collectively, uh, with battalions of lawyers working for them at $1,000 an hour apiece or something like that, uh, versus uh, an average person uh, who cannot afford that or who has to rely on the public defender. How much equality is there in that? And then if we go beyond that and we look at the issue of the protection of minorities, do you protect minorities through the protection of individual rights, saying, well, by having very strong individual rights, we have guaranteed that, or do you go through the notion of group rights? For example, quota systems, or affirmative action. Affirmative action is a form of discrimination. And all these issues have been the subject of profound debate in U.S. courts, as well as in academies, as well as all over the world. Surely it behooves us not to ignore all the lessons of these societies that have trod the democratic path before us as we forge the meaning of justice and think of that. Uh, maybe Specifically authorizing reverse discrimination as a temporary tool with a definition that it must be legislated as time bound. That is a way of doing it. In Egypt, we had this. In our past constitution, we had 50% of the parliament supposedly held for uh, peasants and workers and industrial workers. And that is a form of quota. Uh, Mrs. Mubarak in her last year pushed a quota for women in Parliament. So what is the position of quotas? Should there be quotas? Any kind of quotas? For what? How do you decide it? Should they be time bound? I don't think that our constitutions can or should be silent about these issues. And that brings us to the issue of the meaning of liberty. The meaning of liberty is not just that people are free to exercise their freedom through voice and choice. They must have the capability of so doing. If I am dying of hunger and I have barely enough 
to buy a loaf of bread, I will buy the first loaf of bread I see. I cannot participate in the market mechanism because I have no choice, no ability to choose. If I am uneducated and marginalized and ill, I may not have the capability of practicing my right to work, and so on. So the exercise of freedom requires that we think of human capabilities. And finally, the rule of law, that there should be, of course, yes, the rule of law. But today we know there is something called the civil society, which is not government, which has become extremely important. Every time we have a UN summit, we have the governments on one side and we have the NGOs on the other. NGOs have become a central part of all societies today. Well, what is their status in law? Can they be regulated by a government? What limitations can be put on them? Incidentally, in Egypt, we had a very tough anti-NGO law, which was highly criticized. But people forget that in the United States, it's even worse. There is a very wide opening and latitude for NGOs in the United States, but careful. If you are in an advocacy group whose function is to lobby the government, which many NGOs are, and if you receive money from outside, you have to register as an agent of a foreign power. And this was practiced even with Bob Dole, presidential candidate, when he was lobbying for an arms deal for Taiwan. So he had to register as Asian foreign power. So uh, all countries put limitations and exercise, but they're all ad hoc. I think the time has come to say that societies today have this. But today societies have three new things that have to be forged and put into a constitution. The first of these is the responsibility for the free flow of information, transparency in the free flow of information, that there should be, in fact, the reverse of what exists today, that we should be saying that generally the default position is access to all information for all people at all times, and that people who wish to limit access should show cause, which is the opposite of what we now have in many parts of the world. We should recognize the media and the new media. Media is a power in society, and so is the new media. And the new media, the electronic media, and so on, doesn't recognize political boundaries, doesn't recognize everything else. Is that a right that citizens should be able to participate so openly? Should it be regulated? Who governs the Internet? What is the position of the state in its ability to control Internet service providers or to seek to know more about that? And finally, we have to recognize that there are global and social links that transcend the boundaries of the state. The third chapter would be on the new social contract, the meaning of citizenship. And here what we need to do is to define rights and obligations. We usually talk about the rights, the Bill of Rights, but we need to talk about obligations as well. Obligations, whether they be military or social or community service, obligations to pay taxation, obligations to do other things as well. But we have covenants that give us guidance on political and civil rights and duties, economic, social, and cultural rights. And there are two covenants in the 70s, which we are all party. And there are rights and duties with access to information and expression, and rights and duties towards the environment. Future generations are entitled to have clean air, clean water, fertile soils, and bountiful biodiversity. And if that is seen as their right, then there is no conflict between saying development versus environment. They both go hand in hand. We need in this social contract to say that the state is responsible for empowering human capabilities to exercise their rights, and we have to address these rights both in negative and positive terms. You all know the idea of negative rights and positive rights. Positive rights are things that you can exercise, and negative rights are those that impinge on your ability to exercise that which should be therefore removed. Uh, but if I look at issues of education and health, which are fundamental issues of promoting human capital and helping social capital, we have to ask questions about poverty, hunger, and the issues of basic services. What is the public responsibility to ensure 
that all citizens receive education and health services. You have a big debate in the United States on health care. And uh, many other countries are now facing up to the costs. Um, the United Kingdom had demonstrations about education, third level education, and so on. So clearly education and health are central parts in the capabilities of humans and will therefore enable us also to have a greater definition of issues such as security, social security for the elderly and the young, food security, environmental security, water security. And then a question which is inadequately asked and where I find there's enormous variability between countries and that is how do you apply these principles of citizenship? Who's entitled to get them? Is it by blood? Or is it by geography? How? Birth, immigration? Geography is very important. The issue of Guantanamo is one about whether or not the American legal system goes on to a piece of land that is not part of the sovereign United States? That's a fundamental question. In the United States, you have clearly answered that any foreigner who is caught in the United States for anything is subjected to the same legal procedures. So geographically, there is that. Citizens of the territories are considered part of the United States. But we need to clarify that. Also, what about dual citizenship? What happens then? Do people have the right to participate in double political processes in two countries? And if so, how and why? Is that organized? These are not questions on which I'm making a statement right now, but they are questions that I believe that the new constitution today can no longer say, well, we're not going to address these issues, because we see them all around us. We see that they have become divisive issues in practically every society. And we need to address these issues. And the fourth chapter would deal with political organization and decision making, including the political nature of the state, whether it's a parliamentary or presidential, federal or not, the separation of powers, local authority, decentralization, and subsidiarity, which I very much favor. It's a European term which means that decisions should be made at the lowest level that they, they can be effectively made at. So you should always push decision making downwards rather than centralize decisions, which is what happened in Egypt. And that gives us, of course, the idea of local authority, decentralization, and we come to the issue of political representation. A good friend of ours, uh, actually a former minister, Ahmed Darwish is fond of saying we can abolish democracy very soon because we will be able to ask everybody on their mobiles to vote and so they can vote directly and we can organize the technology and everybody will decide directly. The citizens themselves will decide and all this stuff about legislative chambers and so on is not required. And I am one of those who argue with him that even if the technology for instant referendums exists, it is a very bad technology because today life is so complicated that uh, bills that have to be legislated require enormous attention, lots of details on how they are, and they are not amenable to be cast in a yes-no vote. Plus, of course, we know from experience of great thinkers like uh, 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 Kenneth Arrow, who wrote The Theory of Social Choice, and then Amartya Sen followed up on it 30 years later, and today from California, that voters can be very inconsistent. No, there shall be no additional taxes, and yes, there shall be additional services, and no, there shall not be any additional deficit, and yes, you solve it somehow, we don't care how. <laughs> So uh, if you cast things in yes, no vote, there is absolutely no guarantee that you will get a set of consistent answers. Whereas if you legislate and you have someone that you entrust with the full-time task of doing that, that would be required. So a form of political representation becomes very important. Is it direct or indirect? 
you will have some indirect for sure, and you will have also to rely on thinking more clearly about uh, uh, whether these people are elected individually or through parties or through other mechanisms, although that can change. But we can must also, in that political decision-making, recognize the organization of civil society, the media, and information flows. Joe Stiglitz, who is coming soon here, Nobel laureate in economics, got his Nobel Prize for showing that asymmetry in access to information affects the way economic markets work. I mean, the most extreme case of that, of course, is easy insider trading. If I happen to know that a company is about to uh, lose a huge lawsuit, I can go ahead and sell its shares while they're still high. That is criminalized. And that's why state intervention for competitive markets is important. But what he pointed out was that asymmetry in information flows is not just, I mean, this is an extreme criminal case, but I'm talking about generally asymmetry information results in imperfect markets. And uh, therefore, information flows are even more important in political issues. And then the fifth and sixth and seventh chapter would be fairly straightforward. Local powers, the fifth chapter definition of districts and how to make those districts change over time so that we are not subjected to gerrymandering. Those of you who may not know where gerrymandering comes from, it comes from the former governor of Massachusetts, Albert Jerry, who was apparently very adept at designing districts <laughs> that uh, kept the opposition out, uh, and his name has entered into the language. But we need a way of defining the, the local powers, districts, and how they change over time, and therefore responsibility with the censuses and so on, the idea of elected governors, elected local councils, and the tax and police powers, to what extent are they local, to what extent are they national. Legislative powers, I would be for both a Senate and an Assembly, a Senate being in some way more deliberative. And executive powers, not only the head of state functions and the presidential functions and the prime minister functions and the minister functions, but also to clarify, in the United States you have these problems even today, the war powers, the emergency powers, the power of taxation, and the power of spending. As for the judiciary, well, again, that's Chapter 8, and we would have different types of judiciary, the administrative, the civil and the criminal judiciary, and the economic and financial. We need a fast-paced economic and financial judiciary. In Egypt, we cannot afford to have financial issues tied up for seven, eight years in court. Uh, before you get any rulings. It's just not possible. Nobody works that way. And we need judges that are very well informed about these issues. And the levels, of course, we need also to address the issue of state security. In the United States, you have the FISA judges, which is the Foreign Intelligence Security Act, uh, which allows for particularly knowledgeable judges to give or deny warrants of surveillance on suspected uh, terrorists or others. Uh, the levels would include, of course, a first instance and an appellate level in every one and a constitutional Supreme Court that covers everything. Chapter 9 would be security and the armed forces. And we have to define what is the meaning of national security and how it's organized, who decides, the role of the armed forces to repel external aggression, and the role of the police powers what is central, what is local, and the operation of emergency powers and the guarantees of liberties of citizens in association with such emergency powers. The Anglo-Saxon equivalent is the suspension of habeas corpus, which is defined in the uh, U.S. Constitution, which Lincoln exercised, and which Congress said should have been exercised by Congress, even though they agreed with him. But whatever it is, we need a clear definition of all of these with the responsibilities and the authorities of each. And then finally, the tenth and last chapter would be on adoption and ratification of the Constitution. The amendment process for constitutions, no matter how conceived in a world that's changing as rapidly as it is, and by the experience of the people living under such a constitution, would have to be amended themselves. 
And there should be other clauses as well added. As people draft this together, they will come together to see it. And so, my friends, we come to the full circle and say, as the United States celebrates its uh, over two centuries of functioning with this Constitution and celebrates its Independence Day, we in Egypt are on the dawn of our new day. We've done much in this glorious revolution, a revolution that showed young people going unarmed, demanding liberty, equality, and democracy, men and women, together for days on end, during the absence of the police, not one case of churches burnt or synagogues attacked, Young people, demonstrators against the regime, defended the Library of Alexandria by holding their hands. They defended the National Museum in Cairo. These same young people who volunteered to organize traffic, who showed the world a character of stunning depth and quality. They, they even, as the French say, the first time we see demonstrators clean up where the demonstrations took place and redo it. We need to recapture that spirit as we face an uncertain future. But so did the founding fathers in the United States. It was a very uncertain future for them as well. And yet they were able to frame documents that laid the path to a future. So I hope that Egypt will frame such a document to create a country where, in the words of Tagore, where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come from the depth of truth, and where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the desert sands of a dead habit where the mind is led by thee into ever-widening thought and action, and into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country awake. So happy Independence Day, and thank you all. I believe that, uh, according to Dr. Mossen, we have uh, till 2 o'clock, another 15 minutes for any questions or anything like that. But Hassan, go ahead, my friend. Sir Ismail, thank you for sort of a, an amazing, compelling analysis and a kind of broad vision uh, for the 21st century. And I you know, applaud you for that. Thank you. The question I would have, though, it refers maybe to Egypt in some ways, um, is your opinion. Given that we are still close to the revolution, there's the heat, heat of our times, heat of our moment. Do you think there's a possibility that the political processes, the, gov the people involved in who might rule Egypt, etc., because they lack the kind of critical distance that they might, is there any chance for sort of a vision like yours actually possibly to be implemented given the times we are living in? Which you're, I'm, you're very optimistic. I, I, I'm asking as to how optimistic you are. I'm very, optimistic. I'm very optimistic as to the future of Egypt. And I say to people who doubt my optimism is that I've published that three years, four years before the revolution, that youth will transform our society and that the bigots and the zealots shall be marginalized and pushed aside. And we have seen this happen in this revolution. Bigots and zealots come back again, but that's normal. They come back in every society. Battles have to be refought. Uh, without necessarily going to the extremes of uh, Jefferson's talking about the tree of liberty having to be watered with the blood of patriots and tyrants, uh, but that the fact is that you have to refight these battles and look what's happening with the new right in Europe. Uh, the neo-Nazis coming back. I mean, a lot of these things come back again and again and they're in every society. So we must expect that. 
But the young people who surprised the world and surprised Egypt, I believe, have enough depth and resilience to help keep the country on a straight path. And even if we lose the first battles, it doesn't matter. The march of history is on our side and we shall win. And uh, I'm very fond of quoting an example that many of my friends here will, uh, will uh, recognize. Uh, when you think of the Renaissance and you think of Florence and the Medicis and Michelangelo and so on, who thinks of Savonarola? Savonarola, that bigoted zealot priest who took over the reins of power in Florence for about six years, uh, he forced Medici men to flee the city. He forced the Medici women to burn their fineries in public, which, which gave us the word, the bonfire of the vanities, which Tom Wolfe used as a title for a novel afterwards. But uh, he also confiscated their jewelry. He melted it and went around burning heretics at the stake uh, until he himself was killed. And, of course, if you were living in, in, in uh, Florence at the time, and Mr. Saragedin came to you and said, you know, don't worry about him. He is a mere blip. He will be just a footnote in history. And he'd say to me, what are you talking about? He just killed my cousin. He's torturing my uncle. He's arrested my sister. <laughs> uh, well, today, who knows? Of People who are not uh, involved in the study of the history of the Renaissance have never even heard of his name. As powerful as he was at the time. And why? Because there was a march of history, and the last 400 years have been a systematic advance on the notions of freedom, of liberty, of individualism, of human rights. And Victor Hugo said it all when he said, no army can defeat an idea whose time has come. And that is true. Ideas like human rights have made their way everywhere from sub-Saharan Africa to East Asia, to Northern Europe, to the Middle East, to Latin America. People have internalized these notions. Therefore, they cannot be stopped. Yes? I jotted down some things that uh, came to me as you were speaking, and I'm going to read a little bit from, from what I wrote. Um, uh, your words led me to think about, think pragmatically about um, how to foster participation in a time that you characterized as uh, very complex. And I appreciated your distinction between um, information and wisdom and the need to really develop deep understanding to grapple with the things that we need to, to work on today. And we've seen with the revolution in Egypt so clearly the evidence that um, there was total participation from men, women, children. Um, and I'm wondering um, how you think uh, participation will happen in the uh, forging of these documents, the documents that I hope someday will be exhibited perhaps here at the library as the five documents that you described exhibited in the U.S. at the Smithsonian. But with that complexity before us, and you've talked about the founding fathers in the U.S. who drafted their documents, crafted their documents, how do you pragmatically see the participation happening for the crafting of a new, a second con uh, a constitution for the new Egypt? Well, according to current programs, we are to have a constitutional convention, a large committee of about 150 people. And uh, this committee, I would hope, and uh, many people here know our current Minister of Justice, who's a marvelous man, a former uh, Attorney General of Egypt. Uh, and I was telling him, I hope they're not all going to be just constitutional lawyers because we need citizens from different segments of society, from different age groups. We need uh, philosophers, we need historians to participate in the debate. Uh, and even if I had my own uh, thinking, I would rather exclude the constitutional uh, legal uh, writers, not the judges, but the legal writers, uh, until the decisions are made. And then they can try to adjust the way it should be presented. 
But the fundamental decisions are citizenship decisions. They are not really legal decisions. You are founding what will become the law of future laws. If one may use the Constitution as the reference for all future laws. Uh, because future laws can be declared unconstitutional by a constitutional Supreme Court uh, if they contradict the values that will be embedded in this document. And therefore, it's not just lawyers who should do it. It's also citizens. And he agreed with me on this being the case. But even if it doesn't come about, well, we may have a period where we have the equivalent of the Articles of Confederation. The right. United States functioned for 13 years without... Uh, uh, the new constitution. Second part is, of course, how do you discuss this? I think today is very different. People tell me, well, you're always saying that everything should be open and discussed, but after all, the founding fathers wrote that constitution uh, illegally even, because they were there to amend the Articles of Confederation, instead of which they wrote the whole new constitution in Philadelphia. Uh, my answer to that is that given their time, it was the only thing that could happen. And in fact, the, uh, the, the debate took place in the ratification process. Before the Constitution entered into force, 11 of the 13 uh, states had to approve it. And as you know, a result of that public debate was one of the most beautiful and important classics of political theory, which is the Federalist Papers. I mean, the Federalist Papers were written basically as political tracts. They were trying, in fact, to influence uh, the state of New York in particular, but others to ratify the Constitution. And they would listen in the pubs and so on to what the issues were that people were concerned about, and they would write an explanation defending the Constitution. And they would be distributed. And then when they were all assembled, of course, the Federalist Papers became a profound document of what um, political theory of liberalism should be all about. And uh, so the debates were there, the public was informed, ratification process took almost two years, a year and a half, and therefore there's a, there was a process of participation. It was not something that was done and said, here it is, yes or no. And uh, people were given a chance to discuss and understand the implications of what is involved in every one of those documents. And the fact that they did it state by state meant that you had internal debates in each state. And the state legislatures of the various states would finally approve or disapprove the, the, the vote. So uh, we need something like that. But if we don't get it, well, we'll get the Articles of Confederation. We may come back to it again. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, another great, great country, uh, France, is on its fifth republic, as you all know. And uh, on that fifth republic, the goal left the parliamentary system and returned to a presidential system, but he amended it, and uh, which, given the situation that you have today in the United States, uh, you can also appreciate uh, because it happened before also with Clinton and Newt Gingrich when they closed down the federal government. And the idea of closing down the federal government because Congress and the President can't agree on a spending bill is, uh, or a debt ceiling bill uh, is strange. Well, in the French system, the President continues and has jurisdiction over defense and foreign policy, but the Prime Minister can lose a vote of confidence in the Parliament whereupon the president calls the majority, someone from the majority, to form a government. And that's why you would end up with having Chirac and uh, Mitterrand at the same time, or having Chirac as president and uh, having Jospin as prime minister from different parties. But then at least the domestic program would function because they would have a majority in parliament. If they didn't have the majority in parliament, they couldn't run uh, the, the government while the president continues maintaining the sovereignty with national and foreign policy in his hands. A variation that was tried, but they're on their fifth try. And they had so much blood in between uh, on every one of those variables, moving from one republic to the next wasn't easy in, uh, in most of these countries. So we can only hope. 
All right. Since uh, the new institution will be so important, you're going to define what the new Egypt is going to look like. So I'm just wondering what will be your opinion for this new constitution has to be there before the first president gets elected or can follow what the U.S. did with uh, the constitution many years after the first president gets elected. And another follow-up question I have is uh, I wonder what is your opinion for this first president since there is no constitution and what will suppress to be there to limit his power rather than he going to go on and on and on become like another one? Uh, or uh, what are the support system do you think has to be there to make sure every decision made by the uh, president or the Congress, whatever it is, can be legalized, can be that uh, really implemented throughout the uh, uh, country of Egypt? Well, at present, the current agreement is that there are minor amendments to the previous constitution, including limiting the term of the president from six to four years and limiting any president to two terms. Uh, plus, uh, there are a few other limitations on the use of emergency powers and the like. And there's an obligation that the new president with the new parliament that will be elected uh, will have within six months to create a parliamentary commission which has to report within six months the result of a new constitution and to be put out to a referendum. This is under the current arrangement. So whoever gets elected gets elected with that agreement so that within a year we should be getting a uh, new constitution after the elections. For myself, I was one of those who would have preferred that we ask our military commanders to continue where they are while we do a full write-up of a new constitution and then elect people under that new constitution. That's a personal preference. We lost the, the referendum that was put out for that by a massive vote, 77 to 22, so we're now going forward with the current system. And uh, the elections for the parliament are supposed to be in September and the presidential ones in November. Yes. Uh, I'm struck by um, your comments about the American founders and, and their, you know, something you didn't really touch on is the fact uh, their intellectual borrowing from John Locke and Thomas Hobbes and, you know, Mill and Bentham and, and others. Who will be the sort of the intellectual precursors of those similar kinds of ideas for a new Egyptian constitution, particularly amongst Arabs? Um, who will be that, that intellectual, you know, foundation? There is a, a, a foundation in Egypt in particular. We have a foundation of uh, constitutional law that dates back to 1866, uh, the first uh, elected parliament uh, in this part of the world. And uh, we've had a, uh, a liberal parliamentary constitution uh, adopted in 1923, which was drafted by 30 people. We lived with it till the revolution of 1952. We had a post-revolution, post-republic, first Republican convention uh, constitution drafted in 1954. It was not put in force because of the Suez War and then the move towards a union with Syria, uh, which created the notion of a federal state. So a temporary constitution was drafted. And then in 61, Nasser took a turn towards the uh, uh, communist socialist camp and therefore redrafted a, something first called the, the uh, uh, National Charter, and then subsequently a constitution was drafted and amended, and that's the one that we had till now. It's a very centralized power, and where, for example, the definition of the state started out that the, the state owns all the means of production, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which is, was taken up from the, from the 1960s uh, type of thinking related to uh, uh, the socialist bloc and communism generally. Uh, we also have uh, the legacy of decisions made by the Supreme Court of Egypt, which has some very excellent uh, jurists on it. But more importantly, we have the entire legacy of humanity to look at. Founding Father didn't have that much. I mean, you didn't mention some of the most important, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the social contract by Rousseau and 
particularly, they were very influenced by Montesquieu, who argued for the separation of powers. And uh, that was an idea that they translated into the checks and balances that they came up with. Uh, but see, their primary fear, which is understandable, so I'm, I said at the beginning that every constitution is the result of particular forces at particular moments in particular societies. Their primary fear was tyranny of a strong centralized government. They weren't that concerned about a government that would be an activist government to do a lot of things that they would want to do. They were just having just fought a, a war against the crown. And so, for example, you'd find uh, the non billeting right as one of the Bill of Rights. Today, I mean, who expects an army to come in to your house and <laughs> say, I'm billeting my soldiers in your house and I'm taking the stuff in your kitchen? I mean, it doesn't look like a very serious, but it was in that day, it was a serious threat. The British army was going around doing this in village after village and city after city. It was a very real issue to them. So, I mean, they, they, they created these things based on that. But they were unique. They and the French Revolution were really unique because they had no precedence to look to. I mean, the UK, as you know, does not have a written constitution. It has a series of documents going back from Runnymede in 1218 and the Magna Carta all the way uh, to a lot of other uh, acts that together constitute the foundation of uh, principles that form the constitutional, uh, uh, the unwritten British constitution, which is then enforced by a group called the Low Lords, who are equivalent to the U.S. Supreme Court. In a sense, they are in the House of Lords, and they are primarily great justices. So, I mean, it's a different system there. It's a very different system. Uh, but we have all the experiences from Brazil to, uh, we're having Mr. Lula from Brazil coming to speak to us on the 11th here in uh, the library. And uh, we have the experiences of uh, developing countries, the experiences of Europe, the experiences of uh, the U.S., the experience of Japan. We can draw on all these experiences. And uh, we have our own history to draw on. And in the end, we need to show both the imagination and the pragmatism that they showed. I mean, bicameral chamber to solve small states and big states. It's a brilliant solution. Brilliant. Every state is equally represented in the Senate and uh, proportionately in, in, in the House. But taxation can only be initiated in the House. Sovereign decisions are taken in the Senate. Ratification of officers is taken, and so on. I mean, the, the splitting of responsibilities uh, that are done there created a system that met their needs at that time, which was later amended because it's a living document. And the same thing will happen to whatever we do here. But whether we get articles of confederation or a full U.S. constitution, who knows? Try for the best. Well, okay, my friends, then it's time for me to wish you all a very happy Independence Day, and I hope you have a wonderful stay in Alexandria, and it's good to welcome you to the library. Thank you.